S.J. Regal was born December 15, 1952, and nicknamed Larry. He was described as a social and gregarious outdoorsman and father of two. He lived his entire life in Yakima, Washington, and had worked as a carpenter and a contract pilot for Cub Crafters until he broke four vertebrae that left him disabled. Larry, who was alcohol dependent, was placed on disability. In late 2009, Larry, now 57, would go missing on Christmas Day. He was supposed to attend a family gathering the following day, but never showed up. Since he has gone missing, his bank accounts haven't been touched and his phone hasn't been used. His last phone call took place at approximately 5.30 p.m. on Christmas Day. It is believed that the call was made to his tenants who rented a farm from him in Union Gap and who also owed him $3,000 in back rent. At the time, he and his girlfriend, Ladina Mann, lived together in the 1500 block of South 12th Avenue in Yakima. Larry was known to hang out at several different area bars, including Max's, Boomer's, the Old Town Pump, and the James Gang Tavern. His girlfriend, Ladina, is a person of interest in his disappearance and possible homicide. She used his EBT card several times in the weeks after he vanished and also filled out an EBT card eligibility form stating that he still lived with her, although by then he'd been missing for two months. She was charged with welfare fraud, perjury, and false verification, but the charges were ultimately dismissed after she repaid the money and completed a diversion program. Neighbors of the couple reported seeing two men moving boxes out of the house that Larry shared with Ladina shortly after he went missing. Just weeks before he went missing, he had neck surgery and was still in recovery and would have been in a very vulnerable state. In a media interview after her arrest, Ladina stated Larry had a drinking problem and claimed he assaulted her before walking out of the door and never returning. She attempted to file a police report about the alleged domestic violence weeks after he disappeared, but she had no injuries and no witnesses besides herself, and the police said there wasn't enough evidence. His family stated that no matter how much he would drink, he would never hurt anyone. Ladina claimed that Larry had contacted several people in the months after his disappearance, and she believes he is still alive. She also claims his family is aware of his whereabouts, but no one has been able to substantiate her claims. In 2013, Yakima police searched two houses belonging to Ladina, one in Yakima and another in Moxie. They stated that they did find evidence inside her home that will help with the investigation, but that evidence has not been revealed. Larry has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Tika Latress Lewis was born July 4, 1996, to Teresa English and Robert Lewis. She was described as having a quiet, shy personality who loved Pooh Bear and enjoyed eating Starburst candy. On January 23, 1999, she was with about a dozen family members at New Frontier Lanes Bowling Alley on Center Street in Tacoma, Washington. It was a busy Saturday night, and her family had rented out two lanes for bowling. Two-year-old Tika was last seen with a few of her cousins in the arcade section of the alley between 10 and 10.15 p.m., which was about six feet from the building's exit. At this point in the evening, Tika's mother took her turn to bowl, taking her eyes off Tika for just a bit. Soon after, Teresa went to check on Tika in the arcade, but couldn't find her. Bowling was halted while customers checked under their tables and in their personal areas. One bowling alley employee, an off-duty police officer, called the police to report Tika as a missing person within minutes of the loudspeaker announcement. Patrons began to calm the parking lot, but they found no trace of her. The door was apparently large and heavy, and it does not appear she could have opened this door without help. Police brought in tracking dogs that were used to search for her scent, but nothing of note was found, besides a pair of men's pants in a wooded area near the parking lot. Those pants are apparently unrelated to Tika's case. A roadblock was set up, and searchers scoured the area around the bowling alley for approximately 24 hours, but nothing was found. Sex offenders in the area even had their homes searched as well, but to no avail. 
Employees at the bowling alley told authorities that a late 80s or early 90s maroon or purple Pontiac Grand Am sped out of the parking lot around the time Tika went missing. The vehicle may have had four doors with dark tinted windows and a large spoiler. Other witnesses recalled seeing a man looking at children in the arcade area near the side exit about 10 p.m. that night, about 30 minutes before Teresa began searching for her daughter. Another witness stated that an unidentified Caucasian man may have followed a child to one of the alley's exits during the night. The individual is described as Caucasian in his 30s with shoulder-length brown hair, facial pockmarks, and a mustache and large nose. In November 1998, two months before Tika's disappearance, a four-year-old boy was sexually assaulted in the bathroom at the same bowling alley. The suspect was described exactly the same as the man in the bowling alley the night she disappeared, and two security guards believed they'd seen him at the bowling alley before, but didn't know his name. A few weeks later, a man with a similar description was accused of trying to lure a six-year-old boy out of the same bowling alley by claiming he was the boy's father. The man left the bowling alley promptly, and it does not appear a police report was made or even that the police were contacted at all. About five or six hours before Tika went missing, a man with the same description attempted to lure two children into the bathroom at a park less than a mile from the bowling alley. The children's father chased him away, and he fled in a dark-colored 1995 Pontiac Grand Am. The children's father did not report the incident to the police until three days later, after he found out about Tika's disappearance on the news. Teresa was looked at as a suspect early on, but was eventually ruled out. Tika's biological father was imprisoned at the time of her disappearance and has been ruled out as well. Tika had asthma and a large birthmark on her left buttock and red natural highlights in her hair. She has facial dimples, pierced ears, and patches of light discoloration on her face and the left side of her buttocks as the result of eczema. In 2006, an adopted Texas girl was believed to be Tika, however, DNA ruled out this possibility. In 2010, a psychic claimed that he had a vision that Tika was buried in a specific part of Point Defiance Park in Tacoma. The park was excavated, but nothing was found. When Tika's case was reopened in 2020, police released the witness statement of a man who was a patron of New Frontiers Bowling Alley on the night that Tika disappeared. The witness was 17 years old at the time and bowling with his family that night. He described going to the restroom and bumping into a man pretty hard. The man had the same description, Caucasian with medium build, about 5 foot 11, with long curly brown hair, pockmarks on his face, a large nose, and a mustache. The man was carrying a young girl who appeared biracial the same as Tika. The witness said he thought it was just a man taking his daughter to the restroom. The reason the story stuck with him was the fact that the man didn't apologize and instead hurried off without saying a word, which he thought was very rude. When the witness saw Tika on the news the next day, he knew that Tika was the girl he saw with the man and he promptly called police. The witness was interviewed by police and said he didn't recall hearing the loudspeaker announcement about the missing girl and had left when police arrived. In 2020, cold case detectives came upon this story as well as the other reports all describing a similar man in the area who they realized had never been identified. This man is now the new focus of the investigation. Despite this new suspect, Tika Lewis remains a missing person. For months, hundreds of police and volunteers searched the woods and neighborhoods near the bowling alley. TV, newspaper, and radio reports carried Tika's photograph and her description. 25 detectives worked full-time for a month on the case. Tika's father was released from prison 18 months after his daughter's disappearance and says he will never forget getting that call. Her mother dreams of her daughter being kidnapped by a family who wanted a mixed-race child but couldn't have a baby of their own. She pictures her locked up in a white house way out in the country and is spoiled rotten by being showered with Pooh Bear gifts. Tika would be 25 years old today if she is still alive. However, she has never been found and as of today, this case remains unsolved.
Logan Drew Schindelman was born June 27, 1996. He was described as quiet and at times liked to keep to himself at home. His maternal grandmother and his older half-sister, Chloe, helped raise him because his mother lived in Olympia, Washington. As a child, his grandmother, Virginia, became his and his sister's guardian while their mother, Hannah, left for Seattle to attend art school. He had never met his father and was conceived while his father was in the country from Saudi Arabia and left before Logan was born. It's unclear if he knew about the pregnancy before he returned to his country. Logan grew up in Tumwater, Washington and played football at Tumwater High School where he performed well until his graduation in 2014. He then became estranged from his friends and somewhat cut ties with them after too many racial jokes. He struggled with being biracial, and his grandmother stated that he had began having an identity crisis coupled with questions about his father that he didn't know. He was once picked on by a friend about his race and took it very personal. He decided to attend Washington State University but did not take it very seriously and left after one year with grades that were not up to par. He then returned home to his grandparents in Tumwater and became even more withdrawn. His grandmother stated that his marijuana usage increased along with some episodes of paranoia. At one point, he reached out to his father's family and secretly began meeting up with them while worried that his grandmother would be upset. Around the same time, his sister's boyfriend and children moved into the home he shared with his grandmother, which caused some tension. On May 19, 2016, while his grandmother was getting ready to leave for work, 19-year-old Logan came in the door and said he had been driving around all night and had an epiphany about himself he needed to work through but wouldn't elaborate on any details. She said he seemed nervous and told him that they could have a talk when she got home from work. She left not knowing it would be the last time she would see him. When she arrived home from work that day, he was gone. When he didn't arrive home the next day, she pinged his cell phone off a tower near his mother's home in Olympia, so she assumed he had gone there. But it turned out that he had not actually gone to see her. His phone then showed him going south on I-5, then back north, then south again, then north again, and then south again. A woman reported having seen him with two Caucasian men by his car, which was parked on the right shoulder of southbound Interstate 5 near Exit 95. She saw them on the morning of May 20th, a day after he was last seen, while she was driving to work and when she passed the location again coming home, the car was still parked in the same spot but the hood was up. A sketch was made of one of the unknown men, but the identity still remains a mystery. She described one of the men as six feet tall, very thin, with blonde hair, wearing a tank top and jeans that both appeared too small for him. She described the other man as also having blonde hair and wearing a flannel shirt and jeans. The same day she witnessed Logan with these two men on Interstate 5, three other people called 911 at 2 p.m. to report a car drifting across the lanes of Interstate 5 between Tumwater and Maytown near milepost 92, but there didn't appear to be anyone driving. It veered across three lanes towards the center lane, hit the concrete barrier, and stopped. A truck driver reported seeing a Caucasian man with brown or red hair jumping out the passenger side of the vehicle and running towards the thick woods on the side of the interstate. However, the description of the man didn't match Logan's and police were skeptical of what he believed he saw because there were bags in the passenger seat that looked like they hadn't been crawled over. Some speculate that it could have been Logan, but there's no way to be sure. Turns out, the car was a black 1996 Chrysler Sebring convertible and did belong to Logan and was left abandoned on the interstate in Rochester, about 20 miles from his home. Left inside was his wallet, identification, debit card, $25 in cash, and his cell phone. His car keys were strangely left lying on the hood of the car and a grocery sack full of snacks in the center console. The same day, May 20th, his grandmother attempted to report him missing, but the Thurston County Police Department was closed for the weekend and she had to wait until the 23rd. When she filed the report, she found out that his car had been impounded on the 20th. The car was returned to her and not processed as a possible crime scene. 
Also on the 20th, it was reported that a young naked black man was walking through the neighborhood that was not very far from the area where his car was found. The neighborhood was also known for heavy drug use, and although the description could fit Logan's, no one was found when police officers responded. Helicopters and tracker dogs searched the nearby woods of where his car was abandoned and found nothing. The area is extremely thick and brushy, and only about a two-mile radius was searched. His sister's live-in boyfriend was later questioned about Logan's disappearance, but said he knew nothing about it and also passed a polygraph exam. Police believe he may have been suffering from mental illness, and he was at the age that a lot of mental illness begins to peak. Logan has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Richard Lee Haynes Jr., who went by the name Cody, was born April 16, 1993, in Littleton, Colorado, to Lisa Doney and Richard Haynes Sr., he enjoyed bird watching, fishing, camping, and making his own candy. By 1999, Cody's parents were no longer together, and Cody was living with his mother in Florida. In October of 1999, Cody's mother was jailed for child abuse, forcing him and his four sisters to go live with their father. Due to the charge, Lisa was not allowed legally to contact her son for any reason. Two months later, Cody's father, Rick, would move him and his sisters to the very small, isolated town of Katitas, Washington. By age 11, Cody was still living with his father and his father's girlfriend, Marla Harding, and his sisters in a two-bedroom apartment in the 100 block of Main Street in downtown Katitas, Washington. The girls shared a room, and Cody shared a room with Rick and Marla. All five children were allegedly abused by the couple, especially Cody. There was no door on the master bedroom, which opened straight to the hallway. It was not a traditional apartment building and was actually a dwelling in the upper levels of a business. Neighbors occasionally saw the four girls playing in the backyard, but rarely saw Cody outside. One neighbor reported that he didn't even know a boy lived in the apartment. On September the 11th, 2004, Cody was punished by Marla over his chores. She made him sit at the kitchen table for four hours before sending him to his bedroom around midnight. After this, his sisters would never see him again. Marla told Cody's sisters not to go near the room Cody was in and told Cody not to leave the room for any reason. Rick was at work when Cody was sent to his room but came home soon after. At some point, his sisters heard him being abused, and following a loud thud, his crying stopped. Rick then left the house around 2.30 a.m., claiming to go look for car parts. A neighbor recalled being woken up by the sound of Rick's van, and upon investigating, saw the van in the backyard near the shed. Rick did not return home until 4 p.m., nearly 14 hours later. That morning, his sisters woke to chairs in the hallway outside their bedroom with a note telling them to stay out of the room because Cody was grounded and had to stay in there. They were treated to movies in the living room the entire day. When Rick returned at 4 p.m., he said Cody was gone and reported him as a runaway a couple hours later. Rick and Marla refused to speak to police once suspicion fell upon them and hired an attorney. Shortly after he went missing, Rick tore up the kitchen floor in the apartment and replaced it without the landlord's permission. They claimed Cody apparently slipped out unnoticed during this time and arranged his stuffed animals on the bed to make it look like he was asleep. He took a black and green camouflage pattern bag of clothing with him, but it was later found in a shed near his house along with his bicycle. Authorities believed the runaway story at first because he had been very unhappy with the way they were treating him. Rick had suggested that he might try to travel to his mother's home in Florida. However, he never arrived in Florida and his mother has been eliminated as a suspect in his disappearance. A week after Cody vanished, his sisters were removed from the home and placed into foster care. The removal order alleged abuse, neglect, and lack of supervision in the household and was based mainly on the fact that Cody had been made to stay in his room for 18 hours without being allowed to eat, drink, or use the toilet and without being checked on by an adult. Marla stated that he was a rebellious and deceitful child and needed discipline. Before the Haynes children were taken from their home, Rick refused to allow police to question them. 
When asked to describe his son, he said, like Marla, that he was a deceitful child who needed discipline. Before Cody went missing, him and his sisters were taken out of public school and became homeschoolers after the CPS complaints were made by the school for child neglect, physical, and mental abuse in both 2001 and 2002. Surprisingly, both times the allegations were found to be without merit, and even more surprisingly, Marla worked as a social worker for CPS. However, there were witnesses to the abuse with claims that the Haynes children were made to stand outside for long periods in the wintertime without coats or shoes. Five months after his disappearance, police obtained a search warrant for the apartment and have interviewed his sisters several times since their placement into the foster care system. Initially, the girls said nothing had happened to their brother, but later, Cody's oldest sister told investigators that he had been beaten severely inside his home the day he vanished. In 2005, after receiving additional details from the sisters, the police went to search for traces of blood in the apartment's kitchen to back up the sister's story, but the flooring there had been replaced after Cody's disappearance. A second search was made, and police seized a computer in Rick's Chevrolet Suburban and Marla's car and their camper. Authorities stated that they made a significant discovery during one of these searches, but have not elaborated on what exactly it was they found. The night Rick left the apartment, he drove 250 miles and ended up breaking down near Ritzville and having to call a friend for help. He did not buy any car parts that night, as nothing would have even been open at the time. The area between Katitas and Ritzville is very vast and desolate with a lot of secluded land. Two days after Cody's disappearance, Rick sold his van for scrap metal and car parts. Police were able to recover most of the van, but due to a mix-up at the scrapyard, the van was not towed immediately. Marla and Rick quickly got married, and some have speculated that this was so they could not be subpoenaed to testify against each other. However, spousal privilege only protects you against testifying to things that happen while you are married. The couple split soon after their shotgun wedding. Strangely, neither Rick or Marla ever joined in the searches for Cody. They have never attended vigils for his safe return or spoken to law enforcement or the media except to yell, Cody's not dead, and vigils are for dead people when followed around by the media. In January 2005, Rick even tried to get a restraining order against the chief of police in Katitas, but it was denied. Eventually, Marla moved to California, and Rick moved to the Seattle area. At some point, Rick was married again to a woman named Mary before his death in 2019. According to her own LinkedIn account, Marla was fired in 2003 and used to be a social worker. Court records from early 2004 show that Marla Harding was fired from her job due to misconduct and she was unable to receive unemployment due to the circumstances of her dismissal. She has gone by the alias Marla J. Gordo, Maria J. Harding, and most recently, Marla J. Murray. She still holds the key to the answers that investigators have been searching for. Cody's family has created two Facebook pages dedicated to Cody titled Justice for Cody Haynes and We Love Cody Haynes, and they believe Marla has visited the pages using a fake profile. His case was turned over to the FBI in October 2005, but as of today, it remains unsolved. Adriana Anita Jackson was born September 25, 1995, in Tacoma, Washington, and lived with her mom, Yvette Gervais, and stepfather, John Federici, and had two sisters and a brother. She lived in an apartment in Lakewood, Washington, and was a fourth grader at Tulecum Elementary School. Her former Sunday school teacher would describe her as a very sweet, charming girl who was very artistic and creative. On December 2, 2005, around 7.45 a.m., Adriana, who was now 10 years old, began walking to her school, which was only about three blocks away. However, unbeknownst to her and her mother, school had actually been canceled that day due to the snowstorm. Their apartment did not have a landline telephone, and so they never saw the news or received the automated call from the Clover Park School District phone system that an overnight snowstorm had closed schools for the following day. The area in which she had to walk was a high crime area with 51 registered sex offenders in the neighborhood. 
When 2.30 rolled around and she never showed up as she normally did, her mother initially thought she was just playing in the snow with other kids. At 4.23 p.m., her mother would finally find out that the school was closed that day, leading her to immediately call 911 to report her missing. Police would launch an extensive search of the area, but found no trace of Adriana. They used dogs to follow her scent from home toward the school and then tracked her scent down to American Lake, but police said it could have been an old scent trail as Adriana had been to the lake days earlier. Still, police used sonar to search the water and investigate a boat they found that had no apparent owner. The search continued for nearly a month with searching of area homes, but no signs of her were found. Police said her stepfather, Federici, first told them he walked Adriana partway down the block before turning back home, although they say elements of that account have changed in later retellings. Either way, Federici was the last known person to have seen Adriana that day. There was actually school staff in the building that morning, despite the closure, but none of the staff members ever reported seeing her. Nor was she spotted by the children who were playing in the snow that morning across the street from the school in front of the Talikum Baptist Church Rectory. Police have responded in the past to incidents at the family's apartment for domestic violence. At the time, Adriana was seven years old and had a mark on her cheek and a bump on her head and told police her stepfather had physically assaulted her. Federici ultimately pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge of assault and received a suspended one-year sentence and was put on probation. After failing to undergo an alcohol treatment or anger management evaluation, he was ordered to jail. Strangely, since her disappearance, he has declined to talk publicly about the case. On April 4, 2006, four months later, a skull and spine were found by two of her classmates, nine-year-olds Dominique Eason and Manny Peters, while searching for snakes in a blackberry bush in a vacant lot. The area was about 10 acres of thick blackberry brambles, trees, and shrubs. The overgrown lot was located near the 7500 block of 146th Street Southwest, and the cleared path going through the middle of it was often used by kids taking a shortcut and transients and drug users and was less than two miles from her home and across the street from the Woodbrook Middle School. One patch in the lot had been cleared and was being used as a transient camp and a garbage dump. Using dental records, it was determined that the remains belonged to Adriana. The remains were in such poor condition that the cause of death could not be determined. A week prior, the owner of the lot had begun to clear the brush and level the land. Terrapon Adhan was a person of interest in the case, and his former home was searched for evidence in 2007. He had confessed to killing Zena Lennox of Tacoma, Washington, a girl similar in age and appearance to Adriana, killed in 2007, but he denied any involvement in Adriana's murder. He worked as a tow truck driver at the time of Adriana's disappearance, but had no tows on record that day, meaning he could not account for his whereabouts. Many tips came into police, including a tip after her remains were found, involving 56-year-old convicted sex offender Spencer Douglas Grant. Grant was a transient that lived in a field near the vacant lot where Adriana's remains were found. He told police and journalists that he had seen the body weeks before the two boys spotted it and hinted he knew who killed her, though he never provided any names. Police then verified that Grant was actually in jail when she disappeared, but his knowledge of the area and alleged sighting of her remains forced police to interview him several times, and every time he was interviewed, his story would change. He had also allegedly showed other people the remains weeks before she was found. Grant elaborated on his story in 2010 in a forensic psychological evaluation tied to an unrelated criminal charge for failing to register as a sex offender. He said sometime in March 2006, while he was living in a field, he observed people dropping something off at the site. It turned out to be the remains of Adriana. The record of the evaluation misstates Adriana's age, but it adds new detail to the claims Grant made in 2006. Originally, he said only that he saw the remains, not that he saw the person or persons responsible. Grant was at times uncooperative and then semi-cooperative and would say that he knew something but then not give details. 
He was involved in narcotics and oftentimes changed his story or theories, and ultimately, he gave no information that helped in the investigation. The other person of interest is an unnamed man who reportedly had a relationship with Adriana's parents. He had visited the home on the morning of her disappearance, though no further information regarding this individual has been released by the authorities. It is reported the very spot she was found in may not have been searched. Bloodhounds sniffed the perimeter of 146 Southwest along the edges of the bramble-choked thicket but did not enter it. Searchers riding ATVs also bumped through the area and found nothing. Police Chief Saunders acknowledged that the searchers hadn't pushed into the precise spot where the remains were found, so it's unclear if she was killed in the area or placed there later. Dogs didn't catch a scent using one of Adriana's tennis shoes, and a helicopter flying overhead didn't spot any heat signatures, leading to the possibility that the killer waited until all was settled before placing her there. Today, that area has been cleared away, and a warehouse now stands in that spot. Adriana's killer has never been found, and as of today, this case remains unsolved.